Tears of the Kingdom, there's this cutscene that sets the stage for the dynamic between Ganondorf and Hyrule's royal family. If the latest Zelda game was one of your first experiences with the series, you may have not known what to expect. To the uninitiated, Ganondorf would just seem like a cookie cutter villain. His behavior in this throne room might not have been unsettling to you, but to the more legend hardened players, it would be difficult to deny how surreal of a scene this was. If this wasn't your first Zelda rodeo, you probably had a decent idea of what would follow, because you first saw these events play out in the late 90s and or early aughts. This scene was a direct callback to the same throne room scenario from Ocarina of Time. It's here that we see a young Princess Zelda and Link peering through a window, catching sight of a certain King of Thieves, swearing fealty to another king of Hyrule. Except this king is voiceless, nameless, and most importantly, faceless. He just has a title and that's all we know. Unlike King Raru, no one knew anything about the fate of this placeholder monarch. How was Ocarina of Time's most prominent ruler betrayed? What happened to him after Ganondorf staged a coup? Did he survive this outcome? And if so, how? I'm joined by my friend and fellow theorist, Gossip Ghost, to provide some key insights about the King of Hyrule as we attempt to answer these questions. Howdy howdy, Geist. And a howdy do right back at you, Wiz. Today we're going to try and tackle the mysteries surrounding a ruler you probably never even knew you wanted to hear more about, Ocarina of Time's King of Hyrule. We'll begin with some exposition. Link sets out on a quest given to him by the Great Deku Tree who, to no one's surprise, was already cursed by Ganondorf. Our hero is tasked with meeting the Princess of Hyrule who will help him on his quest to prevent the kingdom's greatest power from falling into the wrong hands. The two kids meet and partake in some nonchalant eavesdropping, where Zola then reveals that she is skeptical about the kingdom's latest green loser of a several year long civil war. Plagued by premonitions in her sleep, the princess fears the worst for her father, but the king can't exactly imprison Ganondorf over dreams his daughter is having. That would make him appear as an incompetent ruler who listens to fantastical whims. Zelda tasks Link with finding the spiritual stones, key components to unlocking the only entrance to the sacred realm where the Triforce is located. But, like the great Deku Tree, Ganondorf already corrupted the ecosystems of Hyrule's allies, who were all vigilantly safeguarding these relics. It's kind of like the guy knows how to plot or something. Link cleans up Dodongo's cavern, rids Jabu Jabu of parasites, reversing the surrounding lands of their respective calamities, and obtains the remaining spiritual stones in return. On our hero's journey back to the castle, all heck breaks loose as the one guy nobody trusted is orchestrating an attack on the castle. It's worth mentioning that this was a solo operation, as we never see any Gerudo helping Ganondorf. We see Zelda fleeing the kingdom on horseback as she throws the last piece of the Door of Time puzzle into the moat being pursued by Ganondorf. Regardless of specifics, we know that on the day following that fateful evening, the day that Link pulled the Master Sword unaware of the consequences of his action, Hyrule Castle was seized by the King of Thieves. And that's pretty much the entire story of how Hyrule Kingdom ended not with a bang, but with a whimper. And that whimper can be found in Castletown. After Link receives the Ocarina of Time, he investigates the town square. It's only when he probes the back alleyways of the town that he finds a lone soldier. This last line of defense had just enough resilience to pass on a final message from Zelda before her abrupt exodus. Use the Ocarina and the Spiritual Stones to open the door of time and acquire the Blade of Evil's Bane. This soldier's last breath is the only indication of any violence that occurred from the previous night. If Link decides to partake in any field research near the castle, he is met with immediate resistance, as all of the Royal Guard is now practicing DEFCON 5 levels of defense. And later on in the game, upon conquering the Shadow Temple, Impa reveals that the castle was surrendered on the day Link pulled the Master Sword, conveniently not saying that it was taken through bloodshed. Conclusion? Hyrule's takeover was an inside job. Think about it. Hyrule's king is hardly ever mentioned throughout the entire game. Even after Hyrule Castle surrenders, there's no dialogue about the king's status. What else would the royal guards be protecting once Zelda and Impa have fled? It's certainly not the princess, she's already long gone. No one except the royal family knows of the king's location. Here's what we think might have happened. Ganondorf decides to reveal that he's more powerful than he led people to believe. He feigned fealty to the king as a Trojan horse strategy to get into the kingdom. Then, before anyone could anticipate, the King of Thieves demonstrates his powers during an audience. The King of Hyrule now finds himself within a hostage situation. Ganondorf's goal was to obtain the Ocarina of Time, assuming that the king would be the one who carried it. Luckily, Impa was able to think on her feet, so she managed to find a way to escort the princess away in the heat of 
of the moment, causing Ganondorf to pursue them. This bought the king the precious time he needed to plan his escape. The king is fully aware that he alone cannot defeat Ganondorf. He also knows that Zelda is safe in the care of Impa, so the king stages his army in front of the castle to give off the illusion that he is still around, but then he escapes. How does he do this? Well, he uses a royal hidden passage, of course. The Zelda franchise is no stranger to hidden passageways. When it is your family's responsibility to know the location and methods of obtaining the holy golden relic that provides your land its providence, you have to have at least a handful of contingency plans in place. In every timeline, secret passages exist in some form or another that connect to Hyrule Castle. However, royal family secrets can sometimes extend beyond just the castle. The bottom of the well and the shadow temple are proof of this statement. Some of the most eldritch abominations exist in both of those locations which were kept away from the public eye. The Shadow Temple was also utilized for imprisoning and interrogating bad actors during the Kingdom's Civil War. In the Child Timeline, it wasn't necessary to use a royal hidden passage when you have the smoking gun that is your daughter's prophetic dreams, combined with a random boy bearing one third of the sacred relic only your family knows the location of on his hand without utilizing the only known method of access to obtain that relic. That's an easy, well, Ganondorf needs to be imprisoned outcome. Regardless of this, players are able to observe illusory walls, secret levers, and hidden passages in Twilight Princess. Heck, there's an entire aqueduct passage leading to and from the tavern in Castletown. But in the Fallen timeline, Link has to traverse a hidden passage to get into the heavily guarded castle and find Princess Zelda. This is the only way he's able to get into the castle under the dominion of Aghanim. He then has to use the throne room's secret passage to escort the princess to the sanctuary for protection. If a secret passage didn't exist before Zelda fled, then they were certainly adopted and built after the events of Ocarina of Time in all three timelines as a lesson learned from past mistakes. But we certainly disagree with that statement's condition premise due to the king never being declared as dead in Ocarina of Time. In Breath of the Wild, we know all sorts of secret passages that exist inside of Hyrule Castle. Link can discover and traverse many of them on his way to the Calamity Ganon. In Tears of the Kingdom, there are even more confidential revelations to be had. The first would be inside of the throne room of the castle. Only Zelda knows about this area's hidden wonders. If Link decides to explore the princess's house in Hateno, he can find, surprise, a secret room located beneath the well nearby. At this point, I'm convinced that all royal family members have to commit about 25 secrets to memory as a prerequisite for being allowed to claim heritage. Inside of this hidden area, Link can read that the princess hid away a gift for him, leading our hero to Hyrule Castle's throne room. Upon entering this room, Link can solve a puzzle in order to reveal a hidden compartment containing his champion's leather's outfit. Again, this proves that the castle was built with clandestinely elaborate mechanisms that only the royal family knows about. In Breath of the Wild, Link can find a peculiar statue of an eagle sitting here rather inconspicuously. But after the upheaval, if Link explores beyond the beaten path, he can find a nook beyond the Great Hall and revisit this eagle, except he will find that the statue toppled over. It turns out that the stone eagle was hiding a grate. If Link opens this grate, he can find a passage cleverly titled as the Royal Hidden Passage, which contains a monument that reveals why the castle was built to begin with, to cork off King Raru's seal of the demon King Ganondorf. And much like the aqueducts of Twilight Princess, this Royal Hidden Passage extends for what feels like miles, until it reaches its endpoint at the Royal Bunker beneath Lookout Landing. This brings us back to Ocarina of Time. The king, knowing full well that he could not defeat Ganondorf, pre-Triforce of Power, planned his route, and, as demonstrated by the many examples that we've provided, there had to have been a hidden passage he could have taken that we, the players, never saw. Whether access to that passage was behind a plaque in a throne room we've never seen, or under one of the giant, unsuspecting statues in the castle's courtyard, he had to have escaped. This leads us to the timeline we haven't touched on yet, the adult timeline. In the adult timeline, Hyrule Castle was morphed beyond recognition by Ganondorf within those seven years Link was sleeping in the Chamber of Sages. Can we take a moment to appreciate how that's even possible? I mean, that's almost on par with how the Great Pyramids were built. Pretty impressive. Not impressive enough, though, because Ganondorf's castle was completely destroyed following his initial defeat. The royal family felt like they had to change things up a bit with their newly built castle in the Wind Waker. They moved the location of the Master Sword from the Temple of Time to a hidden sanctum located beneath the castle that was covered by a statue of the Hero of Time. 
This is where we find the Master Sword, along with King Daphne's, who sealed himself alongside the weapon. It is King Daphne's who gives us answers about Ocarina of Time's King, which we'll explore further in the video over on my channel. These answers, believe it or not, happen to be the Pirate's Charm and the King of Red Lions. What makes these two things so important? The King of Red Lions is a regular boat that can become animated. Daphne's is able to channel his spirit to possess the boat, interact with the flooded Hyrule, and communicate with the Hero of Winds. We can see that this is in fact a magical connection, as the boat is no longer alive after Daphne's wishes for Hyrule's kingdom to once again be flooded, causing him to perish along with the Master Sword and its new Excalibur-style pedestal. And as far as the pirate's charm is concerned, well, this was a charm that Tetra always had in her possession. She's ignorant to the fact that she is the heir to the long-forgotten kingdom from which the charm originated. She uses this magical stone to create a sort of area of effect around Link to see what he sees, as was demonstrated during his first visit to the Forsaken Fortress. She can also use the stone to communicate with Link like it's her personal 5G smartphone. It's King Daphnis who confesses that he created the pirate's charm, and that the stone is practically a Gossip Stone 2.0. It's an enhanced version of the Gossip Stones of Hyrulean legend, spoken about above the Great Sea. These two creations, the Pirate's Charm and the King of Red Lions, demonstrate that the royal family of Hyrule wasn't just skilled at making secret passages, they also had access to special enchanting magics. This touches upon an idea which we'll explore in Geist's companion video to this one, why the King of Hyrule was so intent on having the Composer Brothers research the magical properties of the royal bloodline. This research led to the creation of the Sun Song, a song that can literally speed up time, shifting night to day, and vice versa. But we think you'll find that the Composer Brothers' research may have led to other interesting developments as well. Just remember that King Daphnis' magical abilities and artifacts will play an important role in all of this. There is one more curious detail that we'd like to mention. During the prologue of The Wind Waker, this panel is shown. If you look at the Hylian text, specifically on the left side of the storyboard, it can be translated to the following. Because time manifested itself to him, this person is called the Hero of Time, and has been passed down as a legend in the kingdom. A short while later, dark clouds once again shrouded the kingdom to which it had seemed peace had returned. A short while later, huh? I want you to pay close attention to that part, because it's actually contrary to the English translation which implies generations had passed instead of just a short time. I mean, who are you going to believe, a mistranslation or the actual Hylian script itself? Let's go ahead and complement this with its companion text. The one wielding the evil power who had thought to have been sealed away forever due to the hero's efforts had somehow revived once again. Well now, this is curious. Everyone thought that Ganon would be sealed away forever. They even erected a new castle and built a hidden Master Sword chamber underneath it to acknowledge this historical event. But Ganon didn't return what seems like even a lifetime later. If you look at King Daphnis, he's not exactly decrepit. Sure, he's old, but he's not frail. And while he appears centuries after the return of Ganon, we know that Ganondorf looks practically the same age he was when he was first sealed. We know that this is the case because when the gods answered the Hylians' prayers and flooded the lands, this entered the kingdom into a time-freezing stasis, and it was the Master Sword that allowed this state of frozen time to happen. And yet, here is this older king who has knowledge of gossip stones, who can possess boats with his magic, and who crafted the pirate's charm to be used for a later generation of the royal bloodline. The only way Tetra has the pirate's charm in the first place would be that her ancestor possessing it would have had to have been ushered to a safe location when the gods flooded Hyrule. And it only makes sense that the individual who sent our princess's ancestor to Sanctuary was, in fact, the same person who created the magical communication tool that was passed down to her, and that she had for her entire life. That's right, it was King Daphnis, who was also the ruler during Ocarina of Time, and who we never had a chance to meet until now. We'll explore this topic, other Daphnis deeds, and I'm not talking about teleportation because this guy moves quickly if you're paying attention, as well as his rather lighthearted personality, wink wink, over on Gossip Geist's channel. So be sure to catch us there. Gossip Geist, thanks a ton for doing this project with me. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks for having me, Wiz. It's been a ton of fun. We'll see you in the next one.